Alright, they say an apple a day keeps the doctor away. But eating and dieting is much more complicated than that. Now, Malaysia has been known to be the fattest country in Asia, not something we need to be proud about. So in today's episode on Health Matters, we'll be talking to Dr. Saiful at Andres Bariatric Surgery Clinic about morbid obesity and bariatric surgery as a treatment, but not a quick fix because losing weight takes time and maintaining that weight loss is as important. So join me to this episode. This is Health Matters with me, Dishan Kumar. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Saifullah, for joining us today. My pleasure. All right, uh, let's start off with uh, uh, the topic today, bariatric surgery. But let's start off about why, what does it, uh, who actually goes through bariatric surgery. So, uh, people who are actually morbidly obese. Um, let's talk a bit about, more about that, about the patients that you actually take care of. Now, uh, mor morbid obesity is a person who actually has BMI 40 and above. So, what do they go through actually before uh, going through surgery like this? Okay, so typically, as what you said, uh, battery surgery is done on people who are morbidly obese. Mm -hmm. Obese, either they are obese with multiple medical conditions or whether, or whether they are morbidly obese. So, most often, uh, the case is for this kind of people, right? Uh, for people with morbid obesity, they have tried so many things to lose weight on their own. People in their right mind wouldn't think of surgery as a first line when they want to lose weight. So these people, when they have decided on surgery, usually they have tried many, many years of dieting, exercising. Some will even go for certain medications to, to help them to try to lose weight. But the typical sit uh, scenario is they lose weight in the beginning maybe 10 kilos, 15 kilos, but after many months, the weight, come back, the weight comes back. So that is the, usually the typical scenario. So after many years of failure and yo -yo, what we call a weight yo-yo, they lost weight, the weight comes back, uh, then they, for those who have heard about the surgery, they will think about the surgery. Mm -hmm. And for people who not exposed to the surgery before, so maybe if they come to their family doctors, maybe the doctors will suggest about bariatric surgery to them and usually that's how we get our patients. So that is a, another issue. When people uh, think of, like, when people want to lose weight, they always go to solution is dieting and exercise. That is actually correct. But dieting and exercise by itself may not be sufficient for people who are morbidly obese because they are facing such a great pushback from their body. So for example, our body, right, our mind has a weight set point. So uh, what's going to happen is when they try to lose weight by dieting and exercise, they will be in a calorie deficit state. Okay, so their brain will allow that in the beginning, but after maybe a few months or few weeks for some people, their brain will consider that uh, their effort to lose weight as a threat to that weight set point. Oh. So what happens is, um, the, the brain will coordinate a response like a, like a cascade of like response uh, by the body to try to bring back the original weight. So that's why a lot of dieters fail because their body is resisting the effort. Uh, how the brain does it? Okay, for example, it will make that the dieters feel much more hungrier than before. They, are, they may be on the same diet, for example, three months ago or four months ago, but at the end of that three months, four months, they are much more hungrier than before. Okay, they will feel that they feel tired most of the time because their metabolism will be lowered. Okay, their body will, how to say, their brain will purposely make their metabolism lowest. Okay, to try to bring back the original weight. They are actually their, their muscles will be like much more efficient in utilizing energy. So, at the end of the day. Uh, most dieters will fail because uh, the pushback from their body. Okay. And then for morbidly obese people, mm -hmm. the pushback that they receive is much, much greater than people who, for example, is just 5 kilos or 7 kilos overweight. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about people who are 30 kilo of, uh, of, uh, of having excess weight, mm -hmm. the pushback from their body is really, really tremendous. Mm -hmm. It's really, really like, big mm -hmm. to the point that it is they are almost certain to fail. Maybe out of 100, 
only one will be able to lose weight and maintain that weight loss for many many years that is actually the holy grail or the like million dollar questions when it comes to weight loss yeah. uh, industry i would say because to lose weight is easy i put you on a reduced calorie diet essentially you eat less than what you eat last week or two weeks ago you will lose weight mm-hmm. that is easy that's like basic math isn't it like energy in energy out but our body is not it doesn't obey the law the laws of physics okay <laughs> biology like to mess us with physics yeah. so physiology is doesn't follow physics uh, by 100% mm-hmm. so what happens is um, when they try to lose weight the weight most often always comes back mm. okay uh, uh, so through to the, the 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 hormonal manipulation okay the reward system of the brain is being triggered to make the food sounds Uh, to make the food looks more appealing mm-hmm. same type of food will look much more appealing and much more delicious to you if you are on a diet okay, okay. so that is actually not just your how to say not just your mind playing tricks on you mm. that's actually like a biological reason for that happening mm. uh, actually worldwide right people like uh, doctors who deal with obesity worldwide we are m- moving away towards the um, how to say victim blaming meaning to say is maybe partly con- their morbid obesity problem it's partly contributed by their eating habits by the lifestyle but it's not entirely that to say that it's entirely that we are actually uh, being unfair to the patients for example a typical malaysian uh, food environment right is very very obesogenic meaning to say if you have someone who has the genetic predisposition to be obese you put them in a malaysian environment they will gain weight okay for people who have that genetic predisposition to become obese we put them in a typical malaysian environment where food is everywhere food is accessible 24/7 they, there's no like uh, no how to say uh, no wonder they gain weight no wonder they became obese obese because what is considered as normal Malaysian uh, food environment is actually very obesogenic. Okay, so uh, if they have been raised to be in that kind of environment since they were little, then they won't know that it's the wrong kind of food today. Okay, it's not just eating less and moving more. It's actually much more complex. Now we are talking about the genetics. We're talking about cultures. Okay, some people may have like some uh, mental conditions. They make them uh, unable to like control their appetite mm. for example okay yeah so those are it's not entirely their it's not entirely up to the patients it's not is that entirely that uh, they become morbid obese because of their conscious uh, decision making mm. it's not just that it's actually much more complex if we talking about the causes of obesity right i can tell you there will be like four pages five pages yeah. of the causes okay Okay, um, let's move on into bariatric surgery. Yep. So, um, how did that actually start? Okay, so bariatric surgery has a long history. Mm-hmm. Okay, it, start, it started around in the 1950s mm-hmm. where they came up with a, a procedure that they manipulated the bowel. It's not exactly the same that we are, we are doing now, but basically what they did last time was to bypass a certain part of the um, intestine mm-hmm. and bypass a certain portion of the stomach. Okay. But since then, it has evolved like rapidly and has become much more advanced. For example, in the beginning, they were done in an open surgery manner, mm-hmm. meaning to say the scar is quite big yeah, and then it's such a big wound. Okay? But I think for the past 20-30 years, they, we are moving more towards a minimalistic surgical approach, mm-hmm. meaning to say the surgery is done via laparoscopic method. And another thing is, uh, for example, the procedure of choice uh, currently is mostly sleeve gastrectomy okay. rather than gastric bypass for example maybe 15 years ago 20 years ago when talking about bariatric surgery people always think about gastric bypass but nowadays we are moving away from gastric bypass uh, and more towards sleeve gastrectomy as a uh, primary procedure as mm-hmm. a first procedure for bariatric surgery mm-hmm. so for example for sleeve gastrectomy mm-hmm. um, we cut the stomach mm-hmm. so essentially we remove a uh, three quarter portions of the stomach so we are only left with uh, about 25% of the stomach capacity okay 
So, and then whereas, for example, in gastric bypass, you are rerouting your intestine. Okay, your stomach is actually is still there, mm -hmm. but you're only left with a maybe a P-shaped amount of your stomach, and then your in, much of your intestine, uh, small intestine, the initial part of the small intestine is being bypassed, so that the your, your the food that you eat won't be absorbed by the body. Oh. Okay, so that's actually uh, when talking about bariatric surgery, there are different kinds of it, and then sleeve gastrectomy is nowadays the preferred. Uh, form of procedure uh, and the other ones are more like a secondary procedure for example someone who failed the first one might be considered for something else okay okay all right for for example right okay when we see them they come in we see them then they they they, they, they understood okay what is meant uh, to be a bariatric patient mm -hmm. okay then we do a pre-operative assessment for them then they are fit for the surgery then we will talk to the patients on what is actually uh, what is actually bariatric surgery mm. because it's not just as simple as cutting your stomach and you are set for life you will lose weight on your own no it's not it's not as simple as that okay? Okay. it involves a thorough change in your lifestyle after the surgery mm. meaning to say you are still need to you still need to be on a healthy diet you still need to exercise it's not a, it's not a magic fix uh, for your morbid obesity but your dieting and exercise effort will be much, much easier to do. Okay, mm -hmm. because for example, if we do the sleeve gastrectomy, uh, where we cut the size of your stomach, right? Your, the hunger hormone produced by the stomach will be much less. So after the surgery, the hunger that you feel is will be much, much less compared to before the surgery. So that will make it easier for you to be on a diet, isn't it? Because you are not hungry all the time. Secondly, since your stomach size is smaller, the capacity, the amount of food that you'll be eating will be much less as well. So again, that will be make make uh, your effort to be on a healthy diet easier, isn't it? Mm. Then, we're talking about exercise, when you have initially have lost maybe 10 kilos, 15 kilos in, uh, in the beginning, your body will be lighter, so it will be much easier for you to do exercise. Mm. Okay, Because your joint won't be as painful, your foot won't be as painful when you go for a walk, for example, when you go for a jog or mm. go for a run. So that is how the surgery will be able to help all these mobility obese patients uh, to lose weight mm. by making the effort much easier. Okay, okay so as I, as I mentioned before, a better surgery involves a complete life overhaul. Mm. So obviously, there will be a number of people uh, at what we call a multidisciplinary approach mm -hmm. to the uh, patient. Mm -hmm. So they will need to be consulted by a dietitian. Mm -hmm. So the dietitian will go through at length in details on how to go about their post-operative lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you, their eating pattern, their eating style after the surgery is going to be entirely different. different it's yeah. not going to be the same at all. They can. Usually what I tell my patient is you just forget everything that you know about eating before the surgery because mm. after this it's going to be different. Mm. Okay, Then there's uh, guidance from the exercise physiologist mm -hmm. uh, um, person mm -hmm. to, to guide on the types of exercises that can be done in the beginning and how to progress from there because they can't straight away go for the crunches or yeah. sit-ups or yeah. suddenly go for a run. It, can't, it has to be a gradual thing because okay. you have to uh, remember that we are talking about people who maybe never exercise in their life at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it's unfair, it's unsafe, in fact, for us to be able to expect them to be able to suddenly do all these type of mm -hmm. exercises. So it needs to be a guided, gradual uh, progression mm -hmm. uh, of exercising. Then they need to see a doctor also to make sure that they are always. Uh, how to say fit mm -hmm. uh, before the surgery they are fit for the surgery and after the surgery that they are always in a state of not malnourished because there's a risk of malnutrition if mm -hmm. they are not careful after the surgery okay so this involves a multidisciplinary approach to the patient so we have to ask them one of the things that we need to ask them is how ready do how ready are they mm -hmm. uh, uh, in terms of uh, wanting to change their lifestyle mm -hmm. okay because they may want to lose weight but if they are not content with uh, having to eat less, mm. they may not be able to achieve the good results okay. after the surgery.
unfortunately in our country in Malaysia right um, plastic surgery is not yet uh, recognized mm -hmm. as a disease meaning to say it can be uh, claimed through the private insurance for example so for private for plastic surgery in Malaysia it has to be out of pocket okay, mm. for uh, a lot of patients okay so typically the cost is going to be around from 16000 to 42000 depending on the specific type mm -hmm. of procedures that uh, that patients are going to go for mm -hmm. so that is the range from 16000 to 42000 mm -hmm. okay uh, that's uh, actually obesity right uh, obesity and morbid, morbid obesity is actually recognized as a one form of uh, disease mm -hmm. that is claimable under the early um, EPF uh, early withdrawal okay, okay from the account too okay. so that is uh, an example of uh, how people can secure the funding mm -hmm. okay, for the surgery before mm -hmm. the uh, for to, to fund for the operation mm -hmm. okay, okay. So, as with everything in the world, everything got its risks, mm -hmm. and uh, we always weigh the risks and the benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so when we're talking about the surgery itself, okay, there's the risk of uh, common with any surgical procedures like bleeding. Mm -hmm. Okay, and something that is more specific to diabetic surgery itself is, uh, for example, the leaking. There's a risk of leaking where the uh, the place where we cut the stomach might be might have some defect, which mm -hmm. will lead to the leakage of the gastric content into mm -hmm. the abdominal cavity so mm -hmm. that's another one okay and then there is risk of infection uh, which is like related to the surgery itself and then um, uh, there's a risk of mortality uh, also uh, re related to the surgery in the in, in the 1950s okay the, the mortality is was high mm -hmm. but i think recently due to the advancement in the devices in the technology and the more simplistic approach that people use nowadays to do the surgery right okay then when we're talking about mortality associated with the surgery is uh, is about 0 0.13 percent mm -hmm. uh, these days in okay. these days and age and then when we when you're talking about the risk after the surgery right for the long term we are talking about for, for example for people who are uh, very big before mm. the surgery. Okay, after the surgery, they will have some like loose skins, mm. flabbiness of their skin. Mm. During the interim period where they are uh, losing the weight, they might have some hair loss. But mm. usually, the, the hair will comes back. Okay, mm. after about maybe nine months, eight months after mm. the surgery, the hair loss will comes back. Okay, another common. Uh, uh, risk uh, associated with the surgery is people might have a reflux meaning to say that they have a gastroesophageal reflux may they, where they may, might feel uh, some heartburn after mm -hmm. the surgery mm -hmm. and then uh, okay and then another thing that are uh, very important also after the surgery there's actually it's not a sure thing as well okay mm -hmm. there's actually a small risk of failure associated with bad surgery mm -hmm. meaning to say either they don't lose much to begin with or they lose and then they gain back most of their weight that they mm. have lost. Okay. It can still happen even with bariatric surgery. Mm. Typically, what we see, uh, we see failure in people who refuse to change their lifestyle after the surgery. Mm. They have this mindset that surgery will fix everything. They don't have to do anything. They will just lie in their bed doing nothing. Mm. Okay, So for this kind of people, the weight is bound to come back okay. because after like many, many years, okay, they they still back to their whole habit their uh, eating pattern will like they, they 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 will be able to eat more than before mm -hmm. so they will gain weight okay. okay so for people who are struggling to lose weight right if people who have tried on their own they cannot uh, maintain the weight loss my advice would be you need to have a tailored approach uh, according to the individuals mm -hmm. meaning to say people someone who has 20 kilos to lose cannot go for the same thing for uh, for uh, like for example compared to a person who only only has 5 kilos to lose okay if you need to lose 5 kilos 7 kilos you go for a specific ways maybe go on a formal diet exercise program go to sign up for a gym membership then there should be enough for you to lose weight if you have 15 kilos or 20 kilos the approach will be different okay you might consider medication certain devices that may be able to help you to lose weight and for people who are mobility obese having an excess of weight of about 30 kilos or more they need one of the things that might be considered is bariatric surgery so it's not a one treatment fits all approach okay it needs to be tailored according to the individual so that we should change our mindset towards weight loss instead of just the same thing for everyone mm -hmm. it needs to be according to the person's needs based on their health status based on their lifestyle and based on their job and family situation maybe all right thank you doctor so much for your time all right. welcome
All right, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank you for watching. This has been Health Matters with me, Dishan Kumar. And today, we talked about bariatric surgery and also what people who are morbidly obese actually go through. So if you like more information, please follow us on all our social media platforms and also watch this on our on astrowani.com and also on YouTube. My name is Dishan Kumar. I'll see you in the next episode. Goodbye.